So good evening, everybody, or good afternoon for those of you on the other side of the Prime Meridian. Um, <clears throat> we are having uh, our last um, webinar of the Learn to Birds program for, for this year, this evening. Um, and last but not least, um, so for those of you who uh, are new to Learn the Birds, uh, just a little bit of background before we start. And while there's a few people still joining, so we'll give them a, a couple of minutes while I uh, tell you a little bit about Learn the Birds. So Learn the Birds is precisely four months old. Uh, we went live on the 6th of August and uh, we've delivered uh, roughly 43 webinars and masterclasses uh, in that time. And we started it uh, um, as a means to bring together people with knowledge about birds and birding, uh, whether it is uh, the art of birding, uh, skills for birding, uh, biology, photography, anything at all to do with birding. So bring together people with skills and people wanting to increase their skills and learn a bit more about birds and birding. And uh, as I said, we started uh, literally four months ago. Uh, and if you've been on the site, uh, you can see that there's a little bit of technical debt there because we built it um, in two weeks um, and uh, haven't been able to change much in the intervening time because it's very, been a very active uh, project. So this will be our, our last webinar for, for this year. And in the time between now and when we start up again, the middle of February, uh, we will be completely revamping the site, uh, doing some uh, development on it. And one of the things that we're going to introduce next year is uh, online courses as well. So as I said, this is uh, the last uh, webinar of, of the year. We will start up again in, in uh, January and we will visit uh, all sorts of interesting places like Trinidad and Tobago, uh, like the deserts of Saudi Arabia, and hopefully we'll be back in Newfoundland again as well and, uh, and other places. We've got a lot of uh, uh, topics that relate to um, birding skills. We've got a lot of topics uh, related to um, uh, uh, biology of birds, the evolution of birds. We have one of the foremost uh, uh, paleo paleontologists who, worked on the evolution of, who works on the evolution of birds in the Mesozoic who will be talking about you know, where did our birds come from. All of that's coming up next year. And then in March next year, we have a really super uh, month because uh, it is the month that has International Women's Day. So we've, we're dedicating the entire month to uh, presentations by uh, women birders, women ornithologists, uh, and we've got some really cool presentations lined up. So stay tuned. Uh, Come back and see us in, in January and uh, you'll see some of the things that are um, coming up. So with, the, with that background behind us, uh, I want to just introduce Jared and, and Lancy. Um, I think Jared probably is known to you, most of you now, because he's, this is the second uh, webinar that he's done on Learn the Birds. Um, and uh, he runs an organization uh, called Birding the Rock. Uh, in, in Newfoundland. And uh, Lancy hails from the very, very far north of, of China where it is very cold. So when he first got his first feathers, he flew south and he landed in the relatively tropical climate of Newfoundland. And, <laughs> and from there, he, he does uh, tours around the Arctic and the Antarctic and he just can't get away from cold places. And you'll see that he's got a cat there. And, and, and Lancy loves seagulls so much that he's even named his cat after a seagull. So there you go. So I'm going to hand over to you guys now and uh, let you talk to us about birding in the snow. Awesome. Thank you, Derek, so much. Um, just bear with me for a second while I switch to sharing my screen. All right. Are we seeing that now? Lancy, are you seeing my screen? Yep, yep okay. I can see it. Sorry, I was awesome. on mute. Well, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, and thank you to those who were able to join uh, a few weeks ago for our previous webinar about uh, birding in Newfoundland during the, uh, the warmer months of summer. 
Um, we're here on behalf, as, as Derek mentioned, we're partnering with, uh, with Learn the Birds on behalf of Nature Newfoundland and Labrador, which is a, a wonderful nonprofit organization here in Newfoundland and Labrador that's, that aims to bring nature to the public, to promote conservation issues and the enjoyment of nature. Um, it's, all, it's a completely volunteer run um, organization. Lancey and I are both uh, very avid volunteers with Nature Newfoundland and Labrador. We have lots of, um, of great activities throughout the year, a lot of which revolves around getting people out to enjoy birds um, in the outdoors. Um, and of course, during these COVID days, we've had lots of online activities, including uh, bird learning nights and uh, lots of uh, regular presentations from nature experts across uh, Newfoundland, Labrador and Canada. Um, so be sure, the link will be at the end of this talk. Be sure to take some time if you're interested to learn more about Nature Newfoundland and Labrador to um, check out that link. And, um, and if you're one of the people um, from Newfoundland and Labrador that's at the talk here, uh, we welcome you to check out some of our upcoming events over the uh, Christmas and winter season. Okay, so on to the presentation. Um, Lancey and I are both really excited to be here to talk to you about what I think both of us can agree is our favorite season. Um, winter birding is, is fantastic. Um, a little bit about me, and I won't bore you with this too long, but um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Jared. I grew up uh, on the northeast coast of Newfoundland, uh, so I'm a, a born and raised Newfoundlander, um, and I was always an outdoors person, even as a kid, exploring with my grandparents and my, and my, gra my father in the woods, um, so it was only natural that um, uh, as I sort of came into university, I got into birding, and when I did, I got into it big time. Um, so I'm a very avid birder. Uh, I had an academic career um, that was sort of uh, co-opted by my birding passion. And now I run a, a small birding tourism um, business here in Newfoundland and Labrador. I lead tours uh, year round across, uh, across the province. And I also, um, yeah, and, and I take time to do lots of presentations and teaching in schools and those kinds of things as well. So it really is a passion for me and, and, and the best part of it is being able to share it with people like you, whether it's in person on tours or through presentations. The other perk of what I do, of course, is that I also get to travel a little bit. Um, I lead tours in other parts of Canada and the world for uh, several great um, nature tour companies. Uh, and I'm always happy to talk about those at some point. And Lancey, do you wanna tell us a bit about you? Oh uh, yeah, sure. Um, hi, uh, I'm Lancey. I work for a Norwegian cruise company, Hurtigruten, as an expedition staff and onboard ornithologist. So I mainly work in polar regions, Arctic and Antarctica. Uh, when I'm not working, uh, I split my time between birding and uh, my cat. Um, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, um, now I'm uh, patiently waiting to go back to the normal life in my office with the penguins, albatrosses, with the polar bears, whales, and all the adventures. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Lancey. Um, so I was really happy to look at just looking over the list of participants that I was able to see before we started that I recognize a lot of names. Um, some people from right here in Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, a lot of names I know from right across North America, actually, all over the United States and Canada. So that's really nice but also happy to see that there were lots of names I don't recognize. And I know we have people from all over the world. Um, so just some of the nitty gritties before we sort of get into the birding. Um, for those of you who aren't too familiar with Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, we are the easternmost province of Canada. You can see here on the map, um, the island, Newfoundland portion, of course, sticks way out into the, to the North Atlantic. Um, and the mainland portion being Labrador, which is, is the bigger of the two portions. Um, Newfoundland, I believe, is the 15th largest island in the world. It's much larger than most people realize. Even a lot of people who uh, arrive here to visit aren't prepared for how big the island is when they get here. At a little over 109,000 square kilometers or 42,000 square miles, uh, it's quite large. And in order to explore even just the island portion of the province um, would normally take, you know, you want a couple of good weeks allotted to do that. Um, winter birding, fortunately, is something that you can do in a much more restricted area. Um, so shorter visits, and we'll talk about this at the end of the talk, um, work quite well. I'm based in St. John's, which you can see here on the map is, uh, is our provincial capital on the very uh, sort of southeastern portion on what we call the Avalon Peninsula. Um, 
we have four national parks throughout the province, two on the island of Newfoundland and two in Labrador. Um, and quite a large area of, uh, of very wonderful nature untouched. If you think about the fact that we have such a large province, Newfoundland is larger than the rest of the Atlantic provinces all combined. Um, but we only have a little over 500,000 people spread out. Um, you can imagine that there are a lot of uh, sort of natural areas left to explore, which is one of the wonderful things about living and exploring in this province. For those of you thinking about maybe visiting sometime in the future, um, just to, to point out a couple of things, we do have four uh, airports throughout the province, three on the island and one in Labrador that have international flights daily. Um, or I should say out of province flights. They have flights coming and going from at least uh, Halifax and Toronto every day. Um, and St. John's of course has international flights coming and going every day. Um, so those are your main entry points by, by air into the province. There are a couple of smaller airports that are open for intra-provincial um, travel as well. Um, a lot of people visiting from other parts of North America like to come by car. We do have um, a year round ferry that comes in on the Southwest corner of Newfoundland from Cape Breton and Nova Scotia and lands in Port of Basque. And there is a summer, uh, a summer ferry during the peak tourism season that arrives a little closer to St. John's at Argentia. And there is also a ferry service that runs between the island and Labrador for those of you that would uh, like to come and maybe explore parts of, of Southern Labrador, which are uh, very accessible nowadays. Okay, so our location in Canada's Northeast um, is also part of the reason that we have such a great mix of birds. Um, our location sort of, we're, we're not as far north as we look, uh, very temperate, but we do get a lot of northern birds. We're completely in the boreal zone. Um, so our boreal forests are home to some of, uh, some of the, the best breeding birds and, and greatest diversity um, in North America. Um, and being right on the ocean, of course, we're also home to lots of breeding seabirds, wintering seabirds. Um, so that sort of mix of great boreal forests, uh, open tundra, and being right on the ocean allows us to have this really cool mix of birds that you're not going to find anywhere else in the world. Um, if you were here for our last talk a few weeks ago, you would know that summer, uh, we talked a lot about birding here in summer, and that really is the most popular time to visit for lots of reasons, of course, the weather being most favorable, it's when most people like to travel, um, and some really great birding. Um, you know, lots of amazing, spectacular seabird colonies, um, lots of beautiful birds breeding in our boreal forests, and lots of other great things to see like the whales in summer. Um, so summer is, is a fantastic time to come. Uh, if you didn't get to see our previous talk, uh, I'm pretty sure it's actually on the YouTube channel for, um, for Learn the Birds, and I'm sure Derek can share that link later. Um, yeah, so, so it is a wonderful time to come visit. But we're here to talk about winter, and I, uh, I am not lying at all when I believe when I say that I believe that winter is our best kept secret when it comes to birding. Um, winter is an absolutely fabulous time to come birding in Newfoundland and Labrador. So whether you're a local and, and looking to, to learn more about the birds and go out exploring, or you're coming here to visit, winter is a really great time to really get outdoors and check out the, uh, the great diversity of winter birds that we have here. Of course, it's a totally different suite of birds than you see in summer for the most part. Um, all of our breeding birds have left. Uh, a lot of them have headed much further south for the winter. Um, we have some birds that are resident and we have lots of new birds that come in to spend the winter in Newfoundland and Labrador that you won't see if you were to come here during the, the summer months. Um, and one of the neat things about birding in here in winter is because a lot of our fresh water freezes up, you actually sometimes get to get much closer to a lot of the, especially water birds. Um, and, and you get really great views and it's great for photographers. So winter is a, is a fabulous time to come. Um, the weather can be a little bit challenging, of course. Um, you know, it's, it's, it is winter. We do get lots of snow and cold weather. Um, but it's a, um, you know, it, but it's a fun time to get exploring. And, and I would harbor to say that it, it's one of the most fun times for birding to really get out there and explore our climate during this time of year is uh, is really fabulous and the uh, the, the winter scenery is um, it can't be matched anywhere in the world as far as I'm concerned. So we spoke during our other presentation about how you know the, the seabirds are sort of the center of the birding world in in Newfoundland and Labrador during summer the you know the breeding puffins and all those great breeding seabirds. But seabirds are still a really important part of, of winter birding in Newfoundland and Labrador. 
we do have an awful lot of coastline and the local birders here do spend a lot of time looking out to sea. Um, there are, there's an incredible diversity of seabirds to see here during the winter. But it's somewhat of a different variety than you would see in the summer. We obviously don't have, you don't want to have the spectacle of the, the breeding colonies and the, the tens of thousands of birds um, that, that are on the breeding colonies. A lot of those birds actually leave for the winter. So birds like the Atlantic puffin, which, uh, which is our provincial bird and breeds here in huge densities in some of our colonies during the summer, they completely leave in winter and they head out to the open ocean to, sp to, spend, the, to spend the coldest months. And we rarely see them from shore. Um, but we do get um, some of our, of our breeding seabirds do also winter here. So you can see them, albeit in a different plumage. And we do get um, an arrival of other seabirds, some of them that, that are northern breeders that consider Newfoundland south. And new winter is really the only time that you're going to be able to see them, much like this dove key in the, the photo here, which, by the way, is known locally to a lot of Newfoundlanders as a bullbird. So some of the seabirds you might expect to see if you're here in winter. Um, Thick-billed myrrh up here in the top left is always a popular one for visitors. Um, it's one of two myrrh species that breed on the island. But because it's the most northerly um, of the two, it has the more northerly range. It's um, in, in general, it, it's the most numerous of the two myrrh species here um, in winter. And actually it's often easier to, to find thick-billed myrrh during the winter sometimes than it is um, during summer when you have to pick them out of the, the hordes of, of common myrrh. Great cormorant um, is, is more common here in winter than it is during the, the summer period and can be seen right around St. John's uh, in the harbor, but, but all over the island as well. Common loons breed here all summer long in our freshwater ponds. When they freeze up, they winter in sheltered bays and on the open ocean all around our coast. And uh, dovekey, again, our, our little bull bird here, the smallest of the, uh, of the alcids that occur in North America. It, um, it one of the only places, Newfoundland and Labrador, one of the only places in North America where you can reliably see dove key from land and often very close. They're very tame, not used to seeing people. And they will often, uh, you can often get within just a few feet of them swimming in the water, very close to shore. Great for photography. So it's, um, it, it is usually one of the highest target birds of any visiting birders that come to Newfoundland during the winter months is to see this little, uh, this little alcid called a dove key. And uh, on the other side of the ocean and on the, uh, in the, the European side, it's, um, it's also referred to as a little lock for anybody who's coming from over there and not familiar with dove key. Some other wintering um, birds you see are other, the common myrrh here, which breeds here in huge numbers, but also winters in small numbers along our coast. Um, we get a number of other small seabirds like this horned grebe, uh, red-necked grebe winters in our waters. And when we're sea watching, often there are, there are other species that are not technically seabirds um, that we're always on the lookout for. We have uh, good wintering populations of purple sandpiper, the most northerly ranging species of shorebird in the world. Uh, so while its cousins are down hanging out on the, the warm beaches of Argentina and Costa Rica, um, purple sandpipers actually winter um, not much further south than Newfoundland, and they winter in some of the harshest conditions you can imagine on rock jetties, right where the, where the cold Atlantic uh, ocean is just bashing in on the rocks. And you'll see these purple sandpipers running around on, on those, those wave beaten rocks. It's absolutely incredible to see. One of my favorite winter birds, actually. So they're very high Arctic breeders that, uh, that are relatively easy to find if you know where to look in Newfoundland and Labrador. And we also have lots of ducks that winter along our coast. And um, Lancey is going to tell you more about, about the ducks um, shortly. So another thing that, uh, that's quite common in Newfoundland, and, and Newfoundland is quite well known for, especially St. John's, are the gulls. And uh, don't shake your heads. Gulls are birds, too. Um, and uh, there is a real rich variety of gulls that are seen in Newfoundland. Um, it's one of the things that actually attracts visiting birders from other parts of North America to come here and see this, the diversity of northern gulls that we have here in St. John's during the winter. It's also something that gets, gets us local birders through the winter. Uh, it can be long winters here and, and when the birding gets a little bit uh, monotonous and you've seen all the winter birds, we always have lots of gulls to go poking through. And Lancey is going to tell us more about the gulls here now. So just Lancey, just let me know when you want me to change your slides. 
Okay, thank you, Jared. Um, yeah, like Jared said, that uh, winter is my favorite time of year, especially those uh, bitterly cold winters, because this is the best time of year for golf. And Newfoundland is one of the best golfing places in the world. And I'm not going to talk about the identification details today, but uh, a introduction of some golfs we see in Newfoundland's winter. Uh, I divided this golf into two groups regular ones and uh, rare ones. For regular ones, we have the large golf and uh, some smaller ones. And for rare ones, um, some of the rare ones, they're, they're rare, but we still expect to see them, but others are the ones in the lifetime opportunities. Next, please. Oh, okay, <clears throat> first, the large golf. Um, the large golf, this is the large golf, uh, we commonly seen in Newfoundland's winter. So we have great black bat gull, which is not only the largest gull in Newfoundland, but also in the world. Great black bat gull has um, black back, pink legs, and uh, black wings. And we have a uh, glass gull, which is not only the second largest gull in Newfoundland, but also in the world. Glass gull has pale gray back, uh, pink legs, and uh, white wing tips. Then we have herring gull, which is not the third largest gull in the world, but it is a large gull species. Herring gull has gray back, pink legs, and uh, black wing tips. And uh, Iceland gull and uh, lesser black back gull are large gull species, but they're not as large as the other three. The default subspecies or Iceland gull is called a cumulins. So they have gray back, pink legs and a variable amount of gray on the wing tips. Lesser black back gull has dark gray back. They're named black back, but their back's not black, but actually uh, dark gray. And they have a yellow legs and uh, black wing tips. So I have some uh, extra information of Iceland gull and uh, lesser black back gull. Next, please. So for, for Iceland gull, like I said, our default subspecies is cumulins. So Newfoundland is probably the best place in the world to watch Kumlin's Iceland gull. So we are the capital of Kumlin's Iceland gull. And Iceland gull and uh, most other large gulls take four years to become adult. So some of the Iceland gull here are, are actually banded. So we know which is which. So I have been watching some Iceland gull grow. Uh, for example, this one, um, it has a band with the code 3T. So I had been watching this gull since the, its first winter, and then second winter, third winter, fourth winter. So it was, it was just such a great opportunity to observe Iceland gull and their plumage change along with aging. And uh, 3T, this one is only one of them. Next, please. And for uh, lesser black bag gull, uh, I, I said they are common, but actually they're not. We only have a limited number of, of them each year, and I have never seen double digits at one time. However, we have a lesser black back gull. It comes to the famous Kitty Lake every year since the winter of 2010, 2011. Uh, we call him Buddy. So this is Buddy's 10th winter this year. And in the spring of 2017, I found a, another lesser black back gull. This one joined the buddy coming back every winter. So we call him buddy 2.0. Both buddy and uh, buddy 2.0, the second buddy, are friendly. Well, at least to people, not, not friendly to other gulls. So they, they took food from people. And then a third buddy joined them this winter. So we, we don't have a good number of lesser black back gull, but we have the three buddies there. So it's really easy to see them in a close range. Next, please. Okay, uh, for smaller gulls, um, these smaller gulls, they're, they're not rare, but they're not as common as those larger ones. Uh, Rainbow gull is, uh, is a breeder in Newfoundland. So they're, they're common in Newfoundland in summer, but there are only a few seen in winter, if you are lucky. Uh, common gull or mew gull, well, Mugal, the name Mugal is more referred to their species name, and uh, the European subspecies is called 
common gall. So all mu gall is a European subspecies. So we can call them either mu gall or common gall. They are slightly smaller than rainbow gall with a thinner bill, rounder head, a slightly darker back, and uh, longer wings. And uh, black-headed gull. Black-headed gull is smaller than rainbow and the common or mule gull. It's mainly a, an Eurasian species. We used to have a, a winter population of uh, like several dozens of them, but not anymore, unfortunately. And the last, Bonaparte gull. Bonaparte gull it looks similar to a black-headed gull with a black bill and uh, pink legs. So when you watch gulls, um, size is probably one of the first things you would notice. So for example, in this group, next slide, please. So there's a large gull, it's the largest one is the Iceland gull. So you notice that. And then the second largest is smaller rainbow gull. And then, Mu or common gull is smaller than rainbow gull. And the rest for black headed gull, they are smaller than mu gulls. So you, you will notice the size difference and then you notice different species. Uh, I do not have a Bonaparte gull in this picture, but we can see Bonaparte in the next picture. So this is black headed gull. And then Bonaparte gull is like a little brother of a black headed gull. Although uh, one of them is Eura um, mainly Eurasian species and the other one's American species, but they, they look like each other. Next, please. So uh, like, like Iceland gull, we also have some um, banded rainbow gulls, like this one. So the smaller photo uh, is showing this gull in 2013. It had a wind tag, which is called A1008. Uh, it had two bands, two leg bands, one of them with blue paint and the code 346. The larger photo was taken in 2019. The wind tag was lost. The blue paint was gone, but we could still read the code 346 and then know this is exactly the same bird. So I have recorded 14 rainbow gulls, which are breeding in Newfoundland and wintering in Massachusetts, United States, because they're, they're dependent there, but we, we see them here in summer. So I think they represented an uh, even larger population with the same routine. So they spend winter in Massachusetts and then they come back in Newfoundland to break. Next, please. Okay, so before we start talking about rare gulls, I'd like to mention that in winter, the best gulling experience is in the city because gull get together on the frozen pan, bathing in fresh water, which gave us the best opportunity to watch them and uh, to photograph them. However, not all gull species go to city ponds. Black like kitty lake, for example, this one, is a true seagull. We can call them seagull because they, they breed here in summer and uh, some stay in winter, but the best chance to see them is at the sea. They don't normally go to city ponds. Next, please. Okay, for the rare ones, um, we have two expected rare species. One of them is yellow-legged gull. This is a European species. And uh, we believe that uh, the yellow-legged gull in Newfoundland came from Azor, Portugal. Uh, Newfoundland is the most reliable location to see this species in North America. However, even we have the most reliable location, we still don't see them every year. Next, please. Uh, another expected rarity is slady bag gull. This is a species from Eastern Asia, but their occurrence has increased in North America. On their open wing, you can see some white spots. So that's their signature and the people call it I think it's the gall people call it a string of a pearl. Next, please. Oh, these three species are extremely rare in Newfoundland. Gluck's wing gall uh, uh, is a species on the west coast of North America. We have two previous records. Black-tailed gall is a, an Asian species. 
we have two records. Kelpgo is from Southern Hemisphere, and we have one record. Uh, I have to admit that uh, I'm cheating on this page because Galactic Scouts, uh, they were both before my time in Newfoundland. So I borrowed the photo from Jared. Um, the last sighting of a black tailed gull in Newfoundland was two weeks before I moved to Newfoundland. So I used a photo I took in Asia. I saw the kelp gull in Newfoundland and I got a photo, but it was a poor digiscoping photo. So the kelp gull is in the red circle in the corner. And I don't think we can see any detail. So I used the photo I took in Antarctica. Well, at least the weather here in Antarctica is, is similar. Next, please. Well, last but not least is ivory gull. I understand that not everyone likes gulls, but everyone loves ivory gull. This is the beauty from high Arctic. And uh, in the past few decades, its number declined by 80%. So seeing one is definitely a real treat in life. And also, also, this is one of only a few gall species which don't give you identification problems. Next. Okay, uh, I'll uh, briefly introduce some waterfalls in Newfoundland, including um, dabbling ducks, uh, diving ducks, sea ducks, and uh, geese. Next, please. We have six common dabbling ducks species. Mallard is probably the most common duck species in the world. And you, you just can see them everywhere, every corner in the world. And uh, mallard is the ancestor of most domestic ducks. We have a uh, good, number, uh, good numbers of uh, American black duck and uh, northern pintail. We have uh, two Wigeon species, American, the green-headed, and uh, Eurasian, the red -headed. And the last one, green windtail is our smallest dabbling duck. And uh, we have two subspecies. Next, please. So in Newfoundland, you have a chance to take a photo of the two subspecies side by side. The American subspecies had vertical white stripes. And uh, the Eurasian subspecies, or, or also called a, a common teal, has horizontal white stripes. Next, please. And we have uh, some uncommon dabbling duck species. For example, um, northern shoveler, wood duck, gadwall. They are, they are common in the continent, but not on this island. And uh, well, they are, these uncommon dabbling ducks uh, have some uncommon love stories in Newfoundland. Next, please. So we had a male northern shoveler, which paired up paired with a, a female gadwall. They spend all winter together, and uh, and then I, I documented their mating behavior. So it's a, a happy story. But other stories are not as happy. A male gadwall had been chasing a female mallard for two years without success, and uh, a male wood duck crashed on a female American black duck, but had never been accepted. Next, please. Uh, diving ducks. Uh, we have uh, four regular diving ducks in winter. Greater scalp and the lesser scalp. Uh, greater scalp is much more common than lesser scalp. So basically, if you look, look at a, a, a flock of a greater scalp, you may find one or two lesser among them. And the ring neck duck, the ring on the neck of a ring neck duck is very hard to see. Many people believe that this duck should be called ring bill duck because there is ob obviously there is the ring on their bill. And the tufted duck, tufted duck is a Eurasian species. And we normally have uh, several dozens of them over winter here. And uh, so yeah, Newfoundland, especially the East coast of Newfoundland is probably the best place in North America to see this species. Next, please. And we have a lot of sea ducks. Uh, we have uh, three scoter species, white winged scoter, uh, black scoter, uh, surf scoter. And we have a uh, two golden eye species, common and uh, barrels. 
we have uh, two adder species, common and king. We have two maganser species, common and the red breasted. Well, we do have a third maganser species, hooded maganser. But hooded maganser is a uh, rare in Newfoundland and uh, not normally seen at the sea, normally in, in pound. So I didn't include, include uh, hooded maganser as sea ducks. We also have a buffalo head, uh, harlequin duck, and a long tail duck. Next, please. And finally, geese. We have a uh, uh, Canada goose population, and other goose species are rare. Uh, the good news is that uh, one pink-footed goose came, uh, which is a, a Eurasian species. So if you watch the movie uh, Big Ear, so you, you know uh, this species. It's a Eurasian species, but one pink-footed goose came to Newfoundland last year and uh, fell in love with this island. It just decided to stay. So now we have a registered pink-footed goose. Uh, as for snow goose and the brand, uh, we may be lucky to see one or two in a year. Okay, that's all from me. And uh, thank you. I will hand it over back to Jared. All right. Thank you, Lancy. All right. So as Lancy showed you, um, it could be really easy to spend all of your time in Newfoundland just looking at water birds. Uh, between the, the seabirds and all the amazing ducks and the gulls, there are lots and lots of things to look at around all of our wetlands and our ponds along the coastline. Um, but that's not all we have, of course. Um, I call this a hang ashore winter. Hang ashore is a, is a traditional Newfoundland term that I grew up with um, that Newfoundlanders use to refer to people who don't like to associate with water. It's often used as a sort of a derogatory term for people who are too lazy to, to go fishing or to get out in the boat and, and, and go do the work that's often uh, associated with traditional Newfoundland culture. Um, so maybe you can use it to refer to birds too, because we have a lot of birds that are not associated with water. Um, there are lots and lots of wonderful winter birds um, in our, our land-based habitats as well. Um, so lots of things to, uh, to see and, uh, and enjoy while you're exploring our forests and, and open country. Newfoundland, of course, in winter uh, takes on a very northern flavor uh, when it comes not just to our weather, but also uh, our birds. Um, a lot of our, all of our neotropical migrants have left uh, for more southerly climes. Some of our breeding warblers in that, for example, go as far south as South America. Lots of, of our birds head out, head down and are, are uh, wintering in, in parts of the United States where it's just that little bit more temperate. Um, but we get lots of, of great birds arriving from further north. So there are birds indeed in the world that consider Newfoundland to be south. Um, so lots of really great northern um, birds to be seen in Newfoundland. We have Bohemian waxwing here in the top left, um, boreal owl, which is a, a resident breeding species um, in Newfoundland and Labrador, but really tough to see. Peregrine falcon, willow ptarmigan, a bird that's often very much associated with, with the far north, but is a, is a common species um, in the right habitat here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, snowy owl um, appears here in winter quite often. Bald eagle and uh, common red pole here in the pictures, just some of the birds that, that sort of give Newfoundland the northern flavor in winter. Winter is a really great season for, for finches. Um, and we have these the seven pictures that you see here um, illustrate um, seven of our, the most commonly seen finch species in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, starting up here with uh, evening grosbeak, uh, white-winged crossbill, red crossbill, which is interesting for those of you, especially from, uh, from other parts of North America. Um, the red crossbill that you find in Newfoundland is the Perkna subspecies, which is actually considered to be endemic to Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, so most likely if you see red crossbills in Newfoundland and Labrador, it's a subspecies that you won't be able to find anywhere else in your travels across North America. And the other interesting thing is that these are actually considered endangered. Their population has seen significant declines in recent decades. Um, at least um, in theory, it seems like the, the numbers seem to be going up, uh, at least anecdotally um, in recent decades, which is really good news. Um, and we're seeing them much more commonly, uh, but really a cool species. Um, to get to see here in Newfoundland because it's, it's, uh, it's such a special bird. Uh, next to that, we have a female purple finch, um, common red pole, pine siskin, 
and uh, pine grosbeak, which is also is a resident species here. So we can actually see most of these species throughout the year, um, for the most part, somewhere in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, but it's much easier to see them in winter when a lot of them move down from further north and are actually wintering in much higher numbers in the province than they, they are during the rest of the year. Um, some of them are very common and easy to find, like pine grosbeak is, is easy, easy to find. It's a resident species. Many others are actually eruptive and um, they cannot, uh, they just, uh, they, their abundance varies from year to year depending on factors like the cone crop. So they'll arrive sometimes in huge numbers during a winter and we'll just see lots and lots of them and other winters they can be almost absent. So it varies a little bit from year to year. Um, there is lots of other visitors that come down from the north. Um, other songbirds as well. So bohemian waxwing here, which I already mentioned, snow buntings winter in Newfoundland and Labrador. And of course they breed much further north. They breed commonly throughout Northern Labrador, um, but we don't see them in Newfoundland except during the, the fall migration and into winter. Lapland longspur is a fall migrant that moves throughout Newfoundland um, during the fall season, but they, um, they, uh, a few of them will, will spend the winter and um, it can be a lot of fun trying to, to find the one Lapland longspur in a large flock of snow buntings. Northern shrike here is another bird that comes down from further north. And we do get some northerly raptors, including snowy owl, which is a bird that everybody sort of associates with, associates with winter throughout most of uh, North America. And jeer falcon, and we're lucky in some years that we get numbers of jeer falcons arrive, especially in late winter as they follow the sea ice down into, uh, from Labrador down into Newfoundland. Um, and we can see all three phases sometimes of uh, jeer falcon, including the, uh, the legendary white phase jeer falcon. Well, winter is also a great time to really sort of step back and appreciate all of the resident birds that we have here in Newfoundland and Labrador, birds that are, uh, that are here all year round. Um, so they're here during the summer as well, but they often get uh, ignored in the, uh, in the breeding season when there are lots of colorful warblers and other birds around to enjoy. Um, so winter is a great time to sort of take some time and, and look for these, these resident birds um, and, and really appreciate them when a lot of the other songbirds and forest birds have gone on. So things like willow ptarmigan, which uh, like, your, like your snowshoe hare that we also have here on the island, turn, turn color during the winter. They're, they're red and brown during, during the summer breeding season and turn almost completely white to match their snowy um, open country habitats. Um, Canada jay, uh, again, another resident bird and boreal owl. Black-backed woodpecker over here, which is a, uh, sort of one of our, uh, our more northern boreal forest type of, of woodpeckers that we have here on the island. Boreal chickadee, always popular with visitors, for, especially from the United States where boreal chickadee is, is kind of hard to find. It is a northern species, um, but it's a very, very common bird um, in Newfoundland and Labrador. In fact, I could leave my house right now and within five minutes probably be seeing a, a boreal chickadee right in the city. Um, quite a, a very common bird and one that is always a treat for a lot of our visitors. And of course, the, the American Robin, which is recognizable to pretty much anybody from across North America, spends the summer. Some of these birds are really easy to see, things like the boreal chickadee, um, the Canada jays, if you know where to look, are quite easy to find. Other species are, um, are a lot tougher to see. Willow ptarmigan some, can sometimes take a little bit of work. Things like boreal owl, you have to be very lucky to see, even though they're resident. Uh, like all owls, they're, they're nocturnal, they're very secretive. And, uh, and it's always a treat uh, when I get to see one every few years. And of course, especially for the local birders, winter is a great time to sort of keep an eye out for the rarities. It's not just the common, um, the, you know, it's not just the visiting birds or, or the common resident ones. Uh, we're always out looking for things that are unusual to Newfoundland at any time of year. Because of our location, where we are on the very edge of North America and poking out into the North Atlantic facing Europe, um, we get a real great mix of, of interesting visitors that we might not be expecting. You never know what you're going to see when you go out birding in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, so we get, uh, get rare strays from other parts of North America, for example, uh, like this yellow-throated warbler, which um, is currently here in St. John's. And I photographed this guy just a few days ago, um, not too far from my house, actually. Um, 
Anna's hummingbird, something absolutely completely um, out there. It's a West Coast bird from the other side of the Rockies that shouldn't be anywhere near the East Coast at any time of year, especially not in late January when I photographed this one a few years ago. So sometimes you just see things that are completely outlandish and you wouldn't have guessed in a hundred years if you were asked to. Um, and the Bullock's Oriole. Sometimes we also get visitors, uh, rare visitors from across the pond, as we like to say, from the European side of things. Uh, things like this red wing, which is a common breeder throughout most of Europe and into Iceland, um, and is, but is a pretty rare visitor anywhere in North America. Um, we've had them um, numerous times during winter uh, here in Newfoundland. Northern lapwing is another visitor in early winter, um, is the most likely time to find one in North America, November, December. Um, unlike a lot of European rarities, which tend to show up in spring, this is one species that is more of a, a fall and winter visitor. And as Lancey mentioned, pink-footed goose is another fairly regular visitor that we've had here for um, a few winters uh, in the past. Um, so, you know, it's, it's this arrival of, of the possibility of seeing European rarities that's always exciting for visiting birders from other parts of North America, especially people who keep a North American list, the chance to see something that you would never expect to see anywhere in North America um, is always exciting. Um, being rarities, of course, you can't really plan a visit around seeing any of these things. You can't plan to see them because you never know when or where they're going to show up. Um, but often the, something like that ends up being the highlight of a visit because uh, you've just been lucky enough to, uh, to coincide with uh, seeing one of these really rare gems from somewhere else. And of course, you know, there's, there's always other things to see. One of the great things I always say about birding is that it gets you out. And, um, and yes, you're looking for birds and it's always exciting to see the, the variety and the diversity of birds out there. But just being out often is a, is a chance to see lots of other interesting things. And oftentimes um, the highlight of my day birding is not even a bird. It's one of the other uh, interesting animals that I've managed to run into. Um, it's a slightly different variety of things that you might expect to see in, in winter as a opposed to a summer visit in some ways. You know, winter is not the time to come here to expect to see humpback whales and other species of whale, for example, um, like you do in the summer. Um, but there are other marine mammals that you can expect to see in, in winter that are a little harder to spot sometimes, like this harp seal down here in the bottom left, or a slightly more rare visitor, a bearded seal that I photographed right in St. John's Harbor just a couple of winters ago. Um, so winter is a great time to come looking for marine mammals like, uh, like seals for the most part. Um, it's a great time to go looking for caribou as well. We have uh, the world's southernmost populations of woodland caribou um, on the island. There are, there are a number of herds and uh, so they can be spotted in various areas throughout uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, um, usually in open tundra type habitats. Um, and it's always nice to see them in these snowy settings. Winter is always my, my favorite time to go looking for caribou. It looks so nice. We have a great population of moose on the island. Of course, they're residents, so they're here all year round. You can see them in, in winter just as easily as you can see them in summer, maybe even more easily with our short days and, and more periods of darkness, which is when they tend to like to be out, uh, and red fox. Uh, so just some of, the, some of the other wildlife that you might expect to spot during a day of exploring and birding um, here in Newfoundland during the winter. So I'm going to end with just a, a few more nitty gritty details for anybody who's thinking about maybe possibly planning a visit to Newfoundland at some point. Um, the first thing I just want to remind everybody about is travel in the days of COVID. Um, if you did, were thinking about maybe trying to visit Newfoundland sometime in the near future, uh, it's important to be aware that, um, that during the, these days of the pandemic, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador has its own travel restrictions in addition to Canadian ones. Uh, so if you're traveling from anywhere, whether it's outside of Canada or even other parts of Canada, um, it's important to, to check, you know, the, the current uh, restrictions on, on visiting and, um, and consider that into when you're planning a visit. Um, how much time do you need to come on a birding trip to Newfoundland in winter? Um, the, I want to remind everybody that Newfoundland and Labrador is a lot bigger than you expect. So you really need to sort of put that into your, into your plans and consider how much of the island you would like to explore um, and, and make sure you, you allot enough time to be really be able to do that. And, uh, and so you're not spending all your time just driving around. Um, however, I, if you were in the previous presentation about summer, one of the things I talked about is how the diversity of birds really varies 
across Newfoundland and Labrador during the summer. You can find a totally different suite of breeding songbirds, for example, on the west coast of Newfoundland than you can on the east coast. It's not so much true in winter. Uh, in fact, in winter, uh, you know, the diversity is more evened out. And you can expect to see pretty much the same suite of birds on the east coast of the island as you can on the west coast of the island. It's, um, so you don't have to worry about driving as much. And if the point of your visit really is, is to go birding and not so much to, to sort of see Newfoundland from a scenery point of view, um, it's much easier to come here in winter and base yourself in one region and still expect to see the same birds, which is really great from a birding perspective. And it means that you don't necessarily need a two week visit to Newfoundland to do some winter birding. Sometimes just a, just a short visit of three, three days to a week is more than enough to see a lot of the target species that you might wanna see and get in some really great birding. Um, so for example, you could base yourself out of St. John's um, for a, a long weekend for three or four days and, uh, and with some day trips out of St. John's and have some very productive birding and see a lot of the things that you probably would be hoping to see in terms of winter birds. Of course it is winter and we are the North um, and uh, you need, do need to prepare for that. So if you're planning a winter visit to Newfoundland and Labrador, um, you do need to make sure that you bring all the right equipment and clothes. Um, in general, Newfoundland actually has a fairly temperate winter we're, we're moderated by the effects of the ocean. So our actual daily temperatures hover around freezing throughout most of the winter. We don't really get the deep colds that you get in central Canada, for example. We're not as cold, um, but we're more humid and we do tend to get a lot of wind, so it can make it feel cold. So you really need to consider that when you're, when you're planning uh, how to pack your bags for a trip to Newfoundland. Uh, Labrador, if you're thinking about going to Labrador, can be very cold much like central Canada, um, and snow can occur frequently throughout the province. Um, so you need to plan for that as well. So what you wanna do is pack warm windproof layers. You wanna be able to layer up and down, um, you know, a, a warm undershirt, sweater, very warm winter jacket, hats and mitts. And you wanna make sure you have good footwear as well. Something that's warm and waterproof for walking in snowy conditions. Um, and in some cases, if you're a little more adventurous with your birding, um, it's, it's always good to have ice cleats because of the, our temperate weather, we often get wet snow and ice, which can be a little bit uh, tricky underfoot. So I always recommend to visiting birders to bring ice cleats. Um, it can be a little bit helpful. Um, I'm certainly not trying to scare anybody away from coming. Newfoundland in winter is, I, I think, our, a very underrated thing. It's a wonderful place to come for birding and a, a wonderful time of year to do it. Um, and one of the good things about it is that most of our winter birding can actually do be done from very close to your vehicle. A lot of the birds that you wanna see and expect to see do not require you to be out of the car for long periods. You don't have to do long hikes through the, through the forest or out in the cold. Um, so as long as you're dressed warm to be out in the elements for, for short periods, you're, you're always close to the car, can get in, have a hot coffee and warm up. Um, and it's, it's just absolutely wonderful birding and, uh, and anybody can do it as long as you're just, uh, you dress properly for it. And lastly, just uh, if you're ever coming to Newfoundland, no matter what time of year, uh, it's always important to plan ahead. I mentioned in my last presentation that during the summer, um, car rentals and hotels and accommodations can be booked up solid months in advance. It's not as busy in winter, um, but it is still best to book well in advance uh, just to make sure that those things are available when you get here. Newfoundland, especially in winter, is not somewhere where you want to come um, on a wing and a prayer and just hoping that you're going to end up with a room and a, and a car. You want to have all those things uh, booked before you arrive. All right. Well, thank you, um, everybody. I'm sure we have a little bit of time for questions. I think hopefully Derek has been monitoring the, uh, the chat box there. I haven't been able to do that. If there are any questions, you can either put them in the chat box or I think Darren will uh, or Derek will give you um, uh, a chance to ask any questions that you might have to Lancey or I. And we're happy to, to do our best to try and answer them. And I'm just going to put up a slide now with um, some contact information for Nature NL. Again, if you want to follow along and see some of the activities we have coming up and what we've been up to, and also ways that you can follow along on my social media about some of my, uh, my adventures over the next few months. Very good. Thanks so much, uh, Jared and Lancy. A really great presentation. And I think the, the these not um, 
any questions in the chat so far, but lots of uh, very positive comments saying nice job and <clears throat> great pr uh, presentations with amazing photos and all that sort of stuff. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, I'm going to, um, it might get a bit chaotic, but I'm going to allow people to unmute themselves uh, so that you can speak and ask a question if you like. So you can either type in the chat and I'll pick it up or you can just put your microphone on and ask. I'll just mention, I noticed, Derek, that you shared the link to the uh, to this previous talk about summer. If anybody's interested in that, it, Derek has shared the link in, in, uh, in the chat box there. Yeah. And you can always find it by going to learnthebirds.com slash YouTube. That will get you redirected to our YouTube channel. And you will find it there. And this one will be on there as well. So two questions, is there much chance of seeing dove keys on the West Coast? Uh, and then um, is it possible to stay with local folks? Right, um, well, I guess I can take that one. Um, yeah, with dove keys, I mean, they do occur, they do winter all around the island. Um, so there's no reason you can't see them on the on the West Coast. Um, they do winter there, you know, along the, the I would think that sort of out on the Port of Port Peninsula, uh, Jenna, and I know you're, you're living there on the West Coast, uh, the Port Port Peninsula or the very Southwest Coast can be, especially if you get a, a westerly wind, an onshore wind, are, are great places to look for dove key. Uh, one thing about dove key is that I always tell people January is the best month to see them. They do arrive in late November and December, but they don't tend to be as close to shore and you see them distantly. The most reliable time to find them close to shore is in January. And then after the end of January, they slowly get less and less common. And by the middle of February, they can be tough to find. So January is sort of that really great window for looking for dove keys. And um, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to find them uh, yeah, along the West Coast. Uh, as okay. for staying with local local people, um, you know, I mean, yeah, that's something that I, I, I guess can be arranged. There's no sort of formal network, like a, you know, a birding buddies kind of network here. Um, but if you know anybody, yeah, I mean, staying staying with locals is, uh, is certainly an option. It's, it's maybe following these COVID days, it's going to be something that might be a little harder to arrange. But also, especially, you know, there are great places to stay, bed and breakfast hotels all around Newfoundland and Labrador year round. So, yeah, so lots of options. I would imagine there's also Airbnb places. Yeah, there are. There's also Airbnb as well. Yeah, lots of them. And, you know, a lot of them are open year round and available. So um, let me see, uh, there's some more thank yous. Um, someone says, thank you, Jared and Nancy. I didn't consider traveling to Newfoundland in winter, uh, considering I'd be coming from the upper peninsula of Michigan. Now I'll plan on it. That's from uh, Helen in Michigan. Helen, excellent, we'd love to see you, Helen. <laughs> and then uh, Paul is asking, is there a uniquely Newfoundland and Labrador bird? It's not really a uniquely Newfoundland and Labrador bird. We don't have anything that's endemic as a species. We do have, uh, I mentioned the red crossbill, which is an endemic subspecies. So that race, maybe one of these days, I have my hopes that they'll actually split it like they did with the Cassia crossbird, uh, crossbill on the West Coast of North America um, a couple of years ago. They split it into a separate species. So maybe one day we'll have our own species of crossbill. Um, the most unique thing, I think, especially in winter, is the ability to see some of these um, seabirds, especially dove key and thick-billed myrrh, close to shore. And it's really Newfoundland is the only place you can expect um, to see either one of those from shore without having to, to you know, take a, um, a boat ride out into the, the rough winter ocean. So, you know, I think it's the opportunity to see some of these really northern species up close that it, that's really unique to, to the island. When I lived in Newfoundland, we used to do a lot of winter diving and sometimes we'd go out in an aluminum boat or aluminum boat, sorry. Uh, and uh, often we would see dove keys underwater and they are so cute to see underwater. They're, they're like a little tiny pigeon under the water. It's a, it's a strange thing to see. Uh, do you get black capped chickadee in Newfoundland? Yes, we do have black capped chickadee and it's another, we have a, there's a, we have our own race of black capped chickadee as well. Um, that's, that's slightly different um, than even the ones that are found in Labrador apparently. Uh, but yeah, we have black capped chickadee. They're resident 
easy to see. So we have two species of chickadee, the boreal chickadee, which I know I showed earlier in the presentation, and black cat. And we often, in the winter especially, see them in little mixed flocks. So it's really fun to be able to see them together and compare them. Very different behaviors for such closely related birds. And Wayne Humphreys has a question. And I, I have to just say that uh, Wayne and I were friends in undergraduate days in university like 40 years ago. And uh, it's the first time I've uh, interacted with him since then. So it's kind of cool. Um, so last year you hit the jackpot uh, with warblers late in the fall and early winter, Townsends, et cetera. Any idea why last year there was uh, such a large number? Lancey, you wanna, you got any tackle on well, that? Well, I, I don't know the reason because Townsend's warbler is really a Western, West Coast species. And we, we do get a, well, not a lot of them, but we do get them regularly. Um, and then not not even the rest of part of the Atlantic Canada. So I don't have the I don't have the answer for why we got that many. Uh, not not specifically for uh, last year, but we also got three Thompson's warbler this year, and uh, we we still have like six five or six warbler species right now in in winter. So yeah, it, it may be just. A mild winter this year and uh, last year. Why we have a small fallout of a Townsend warbler? I don't know the exact reason. Yeah, yeah, the Townsend but, warbler one is is something that's baffled local birders for. Yeah, which is yeah. We just, yeah, a lot, I think yeah. Last year, I think we got like fourteen something. Yeah, yeah. we do. Yeah, it's, it's just amazing. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those things we probably just never really fully understand. Yeah, yeah, they're just a long way from home. Think about it, they should be in maybe California, <laughs> but not in Newfoundland, but they're here. So one more question uh, from Elizabeth uh, saying, what are the common feeder species in, Saint, in the St. John's area? Yeah, so you know, you know, dark-eyed junco is probably the most common at least, you know, most feeders, that's, that's the bird that flocks up in winter and comes to feeders very reliably. Um, so lots of dark-eyed juncos. American goldfinch um, is a species that, interestingly, 30 years ago was considered to be pretty rare in Newfoundland. And it's one of those that sort of really exploded northeast out of their range and is now our most common finch across the island. Uh, very well established. Um, they come to feeders a lot, um, depending on where you live. Uh, this year, evening grosbeaks very reliably some of the other finches. Red crossbill is actually becoming a, a fairly regular uh, feeder visitor in certain areas. Um, so it's those finches, black capped chickadees, dark eyed juncos are sort of the, the most reliable and of course house sparrows where you get them. But that's another species that's been declining. Yeah. And blue jay. We got blue lots jay. of blue jay. And North, northern <laughs> flicker. If you have suet out, we get lots of northern flickers and hairy woodpeckers um, and downy woodpeckers coming to feeders as well. Yeah. Yeah, I remember okay, my my first Harry with the Packer was in Jer's backyard in Newfoundland. <laughs> so thanks, uh, guys. I think that was the last question. Um, so I think we will close it up for the evening or the afternoon where you are. Um, thanks again for uh, uh, for for doing this and for your support of Learn the Birds and and thanks everybody for attending. Uh, you will. Uh, end up on the newsletter list for our Monday birding newsletter, uh, which tells you about what's happening next uh, on Learn the Birds. Um, so if you don't want to be on it, you can always just unsubscribe from the end, but I think it will be worth staying on it because next year we have an amazing program uh, coming up and I'm hoping that, uh, uh, that Jared and Nancy will be back again next year too. So Thanks a lot, guys, and thanks everybody for coming, and uh, good night from Learn the Birds. See you, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.